Hello, welcome everyone uh, to the performance Bird Songs of a Hyperorganism. My name is Daniela Silvestrin and I'm part of the curatorial team uh, behind the Collective Practices Program at Akut Macht Neu, which is the context uh, in which this event is taking place. Before I hand over to the two artists, Marte Ruel and Ari Ehrenberg, who developed this live performance for our program, I just quickly wanted to say a few words about the Collective Practices Program for those who might not know about it yet. So um, Collective Practices is a series of events that will run until January 2021, and uh, its aim is to examine various forms and notions of collective practice as they relate to artistic creation, cultural organizing, and uh, social coexistence. Um, together with various artists, theorists, activists, and uh, the audience, of course, we look at what practices, what practicing uh, collectivity means by addressing and exploring a broad field of practices, methods, questions uh, related to forms of collectivity, multiple authorship, social living, and working together. You can find uh, all the information and uh, materials and news and um, yeah, texts about uh, or related to our program on uh, our websites, which are akutmachtneu.de and uh, collectivepractices.net. And um, the Collective Practices program has four thematic strands. Uh, we call them explorations. Um, these four strands are narratives, care, resistance and knowledges. And um, these were the thematic clusters uh, through which we wanted to focus on specifically relevant aspects or fields within which collectivity and collective practice take shape and can de um, develop transformative energies. And um, this event and performance today is a result of me inviting the artists already way before Corona and um, to develop a collaborative project for our series and in relation to or in resonance with uh, specifically the exploration called Knowledges. Um, within this cluster of Knowledges, our aim is to investigate forms of knowledge and practice that challenge and break down scientific paradigms and um, to bring together different alternative approaches to the generation of knowledge. Um, the events presented within this cluster deal with the question of how reflection and openness to other forms and definitions of, um, of perceiving truths can be fruitful for the production of knowledge. And um, such reflections are central to the work of the two artists presenting the performance today. And um, the performance will be followed by a short talks by each of the artists in which we will be able to hear more about their work and research. And there will also be a Q&A at the end. And for this Q&A, you can send us your questions in the chat um, that you can find uh, below the stream window on the website or also on Facebook. And uh, we will collect your questions and include them in the conversation at the end. Um, another important note is that uh, for the best possible experience, we would recommend you um, to use your headphones uh, while watching the performance. And um, yeah, as a last quick word before finally handing over to the artists, um, I just wanted to say that all this is made possible through the funding of the Hauptstadt Kulturfonds in Berlin, and we are especially funding in such insecure times for cultural production. And on the technical side, I wanted to thank uh, Boiling Heads Media for the great support uh, for the streaming and making this global collaboration between Berlin and Zurich and Mexico City possible. And last but not least, a very warm thank you to my colleague Olga Wiedemann behind the scenes for the great organization and setting up of the event. And um, yeah, so without further ado, um, enjoy Bird Songs of a Hyperorganism and uh, see you all afterwards for the artist talks and uh, Q&A. Thank you. 
was prevented from empathy. Yet, I experienced a remote torment of separation. It was the invention of absence, the innocent idea of the enemy, the violent impulse of the nation. I hear her 
talking about the death of the lost world. must have been that laws which question the universal principle of life. How would we come to understand that if all we knew was life?
As children, we were embedded in a lively world, experiencing affectionate relations with our surroundings, playfully engaging with shadows, plants, and the plurality of matter. But we too were formed in a culture of inanimate matter. Yet, while knowing this, she would still dance, still sing. She would color with her work, and in such gestures, the world became alive. necessary for our integrated becoming, she threatened. With her obsession with seeds and compost, humidity and ground, she would live. Her world would live. Symphony of our world, she too began to see. that death had been an artifice all along. Um, for this great performance and experience. Um, I'm a bit sad that it's already over. Um, before we will talk about what we saw and heard here, both artists now will give a short presentation about their work and research. And we will start with Marte Roel, whom I quickly want to introduce before handing over uh, the word to him. 
So Marte is a uh, Mexican artist and researcher based in Zurich, Switzerland. And um, next to his artistic practice, he's working on his uh, PhD dissertation now in uh, cognitive neuropsychology at the University of Zurich. And he's also one of the founders and part of the artist collective Be Another Lab, which is an interdisciplinary multinational group dedicated to understanding, communicating and expanding subjective experience. Um, the focus of his artistic practice lies in the convergence of art and science, understanding them as complementary bodies of knowledge under a holistic perspective of cognition. So um, I'm now looking much forward to hearing about uh, his very various fields of work and research in more detail. And um, as soon as Marte is ready, I would say the floor is his or yours. You hear me now? Um... Yes. I hope that there's enough light right now because uh, I, I didn't notice that it started getting dark while I was doing this show, but uh, I'll start now. And thank you, Daniela. Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, all of this. It's been an interesting path and interesting turn of events that we, we performed a live cinema with Ari that we haven't done in, in many years, I don't know, eight years or so, that we didn't do a work like this. But I think the, the current corona situation allowed us to, to try it out. So uh, I will start now my presentation. Uh, so uh, it's entitled The uh, Dissolving Body. And I will tell you a little bit about my research, both uh, personally and artistically, but also what I'm doing in, in science. Um, I don't know if I should be seeing my slides or if it's possible to see them. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I will try to define somehow what is the body or rather define that it's not so definable. And for this, I will start by asking some questions and, and trying to get the like people to think about these things. Probably you've thought about it before, but uh, it's about the ba uh, boundaries of our bodies and whether we can define them objectively. Uh, because, you know, there is, a, like we, I guess, in Western culture, we think a lot about objectivity and also within science, of course. Um, so the first thing is that comes to mind, of course, is the space, no? So the limits of, of the body, where, where our body starts and where it ends. But I have uh, this series of examples uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, well, where the, the boundaries are not so clear, no? First, on the, on the left-hand side, we have a few sort of prostheses, no? Where like this spatial body is extended. Then we have this uh, uh, popular example of Stellar. And then on the right hand, we have the, the man with the longest beard ever recorded. And uh, the beard is still, you can visit the museum and see it and it has turned yellow over the years. And uh, I think the, all these examples show that it's not, I mean, would we consider the beard to be part of a, the person's body or stellar seer or the case of, of people that are wearing prosthesis? Is it, um, would that still be part of the objective body or how would we define it? An alternative would be actually to, to go for DNA and, and try to, uh, yeah, say that it's actually the genetic code and genetic congruence that defines our, our our body and who we are bodily. But it turns out that our DNA is incredibly more complex and we have a lot of parasites, including virus, of course. And uh, yeah, a lot of parasites with different DNAs interacting with us constantly. And there are some uh, cases, for for example, where they, they found a huge, number of male cells in 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 women's body after they gave birth of course and uh, then this is uh, of course another extension of this which is, which is fecal transplants and how this is uh, as it says here in the video it's miracle poop and it's this new miracle uh, uh, sort of thing where we get somebody else's biome through poop and we yeah yeah implant it or transplant it into ourselves and apparently it has quite some benefits and 
this clearly uh, says how yeah our body is not so definable in that sense and then i have this example which is a little bit boring but basically what uh, i like about it is that the they weren't sure at some point of what was in a in the womb that created each part of the of the of the insect whether it was genetically or or something else and it turned out it was actually the egg and how uh, the egg, yeah chemicals are distributed around the egg and this is quite interesting because of course the way we are uh, we grow into an adult body or an, into a developed body is definitely entangled with the rest of our world and especially if you think of gravity there is I mean, really little chances that we would be able to grow up as we do if it was in different gravitational conditions. So, I mean, we're completely entangled with our with our surroundings and our body. I think for me, the interesting part about the body and the reason why I like to study it is because this entanglement, even though you can look at it at different levels of description, uh, when you look at it from the body, uh, it's clear that it's um, yeah, it's phenomenologically clear. It's it's very immediate phenomenally. So now I will talk about this phenomenal part, which is the bodily self or the sense of body. And a lot of what I'm uh, what I will mention here actually comes more from my work here in in the in neuropsychology. And uh, but yeah, it extends to my artistic practice. But but I decided to go for this route now also to. To sort of have a conversation together with Ari and and see what develops from here. So, if probably if you're probably familiar with this uh, example of the rubber hand illusion, and for those of you that are not, I'm not sure if you can see my yeah you can see my mouse. So we have this person uh, wearing blue that has a rubber hand in front of him. So it's not a, it's a fake hand, right? And instead of it, he see, uh, yeah, I mean, instead of his own hand, he sees the rubber hand. So there's a wall covering his own hand. And he can only see the rubber hand. And then this other guy wearing green is simultaneously stroking the rubber hand as well as the participant's hand. And uh, let's see what happens after a while. There. So you could see that he was tricked, right? He was tricked into believing that the rubber hand was his own hand. And uh, it turns out that phenomenally, we can actually alter the, the body uh, quite easily with just uh, uh, pairing different sensory signals. And so again, not only uh, objectively, if you may, uh, the body is really boundless somehow and difficult to define, but also subjectively, it's it's very plastic, it's liquid and dissolving. And I think this is probably the most well-known example, but there are others and, oh, but yeah, I, I wasn't expecting that transition, but we have, a, a, so often the sense of body is defined uh, by like this subjective experience of being a body, embodiment in the very uh, preliminary sense. And I'm sorry, it's getting so dark. Uh, but I don't want to run to, to uh, you don't see me anyways, sorry. So we have these three aspects of the sense of body, which are the self-identification, which is uh, often mentioned, or, or yeah, actually in the literature, it's more common to say body ownership, the feeling that my body belongs to me. And um, I guess self-identification is more inclusive and I like the term better. Then we have agency, this feeling of control that we, we can actually direct our actions and uh, and we have this sense of yeah control over our bodies and then self-location where i am wh where is my perspective let's say um this is for example another experiment uh, illusion experimental illusion where participants have an out-of-body experience sort of and what happens is that they see themselves from behind so there is a camera connected to um, a head mounted display, a virtual reality headset. And then the participant is wearing the, the virtual reality headset and sees himself from the perspective of the camera, right? So he's seeing himself from behind. And then somebody comes and strokes the back of the participant and the participant feels because he's seeing himself in front of him that he's displayed, displaced, I'm sorry, uh, towards the front. So it's a sort of out of body illusion induced in the lab. 
And these two uh, experimental works were quite important for the development of, a, of the discipline. And, and um, yeah, I think they are quite interesting again in that this feeling of being a body is very liquid. And I will show you another example, which is quite fun from Erson's group. And whoops, I was not expecting that. Let me move it forward. So we have here a tall participant wearing a virtual reality headset again. And then what we see is an experimenter. So we see the participant, right? And he's, he's uh, wearing a virtual reality headset again that displays the perspective of a, of a Barbie doll. And after, uh, uh, so this experimenter is stroking the leg of both the Barbie doll as well as the participant. And let's see what happens. So strokes, the participant sees the perspective of the Barbie doll. And after a while, they ask the participant, what is the size of this object? And they put the object in front of the cameras and he must respond. And this is what he says, right? So his perception of the world changed after altering his per the perception of his own body. And this continues to happen with the smaller uh, ob objects or, or bodies. So I'll move it forward and you will see again that the participant perceives the object as much larger now even. And then in the last scenario, we have the participant embodying this huge body. And then he says, what is the size of this object? And for you that are critical, there was there were control conditions in this study where, where the, the, they would see from the same perspective but without feeling embodied. And to do this, you, you just show the vision. So the vision is not enough. So having the perspective is not enough, but actually having these sensory, multi-sensory signals is what binds uh, to the sense of body. So, oh, horrible transitions, I'm sorry about that. Um, so this is a, a study, I mean, just going to the limits, and uh, sorry, I will go back with my horrible transition to, to tell you something about this one, because I think what is most interesting about this is that uh, the perception of the body changes our perception of the world but at the same time, it is the perception of the world. So the, the peripheral signals, what we see, what is happening beyond uh, us uh, uh, is what is altering the body. So it shows this loop. And again, this entangled relation between the environment and the self that is completely this, uh, impossible to disentangle. Um, and I think whenever it is disentangled, it's when we have a, a, yeah, a sense of, disembodiment of alienation and, and uh, so I think being clear about this binding is uh, can be quite important. So now I will go to this study. It's just a funny study that was recently published and what it shows is that participants not only embody uh, like humanoid objects but also uh, uh, in this case a grapefruit and participants reported feeling more that they were the, the grapefruit when they simultaneously smelled a grapefruit when they were squeezed. So what happens is that participants are wearing a virtual reality headset and they look down and instead of, of uh, seeing their own body, they see a grapefruit. And then there comes this person and starts squeezing them. And as they see this squeezing, there's a, another coming out and the other is either that of a grapefruit, so congruent with what they see or that of a strawberry. And when they smell the grapefruit, they feel more that they are in this body or they, they are this grapefruit than when, when the smell is not congruent. And here is another example of a, of a study where the, like the first one that I showed the out of body experience, but with sound. So participants hear themselves walking around themselves. And after a while, they feel that they are this, uh, they are hearing themselves walking around them. So there is this term feeling of a presence, the feeling that there is someone, when you hear someone walking around you, there is this strong feeling of a presence. And participants report that strongly, however, that presence is themselves. 
now, as Daniela said, outside of the, the scientific practice, we uh, a lot of these bodily illusions are used in, in artistic contexts to uh, address several uh, things. And it's basically a space for dialogue, what we uh, do with this. And, and this dialogue is open by a technique to embody another person. And by swapping bodies, swapping perspectives, this opens up a space for a conversation. And we develop in interventions using this uh, knowledge derived from science and di different disciplines to create these interventions in uh, yeah, in social contexts that can be very diverse. And one such context is this one that I will mention. And I think that will be it for my presentation. Uh, which is just one of the examples that I like to give of the work that we did in Mexico a few years ago. Uh, so these people, these children, we were working with them for about a week. Uh, I mean, it was a, a school and what we did a series of workshops with different techniques, painting and, and a lot of stuff. And they eventually created a narrative about what they wanted to, what they would do in their community. This is uh, quite a marginalized community and what they would do if they were say the president and uh, so they they did their own stories they narrated it and then we had the actual leaders of the community embody them they swapped bodies with the chi these children and heard from the perspective of the child what it it what yeah what could be done and this is just an example of the sort of interventions that we do that is very site specific and and always done in dialogue with the communities that we're working with um yeah, so I guess just uh, before ending, I want to point out this other paper coming from, from actually science. And uh, what it, uh, it's called Evidence for a Collective Intelligence Factor in the Performance of Human Groups. And I want to say a few things. First, that it was a little bit awkward for me to, to work remotely in this sense, because it's uh, uh, about collectivity. And then now more recently, the uh, it was difficult for me to uh, consult with the idea of using headphones, but also it sounds so much better. But re the recommendation on wearing headphones is a little bit incongruent because you cannot listen to it with another person, really. And I can imagine that people at home might be uh, with someone wanting to listen. Uh, and as this is the case, I, I think there are like many of the factors that contribute to collective intelligence, apparently, are not the factors that we generally construct in our social setting. So, for example, being monological is not uh, correlated with collective intelligence, as I am. So, uh, conversation, turn-taking of the people involved, and uh, the number of women in the group, uh, it actually uh, affects the collective uh, intelligence. So just with that in mind, I hope that we can engage in a more collective uh, conversation after this very monological presentation. And just think about the body. I think my whole point is to think about the body as this lively subject that is in integration with, with the world. And I think it relates to the piece that you saw somehow even if not so apparent, but we will talk about it in a moment. And I think with that, I will give the mic to, to Ari. I don't know if Daniela will come back or Ari is next, but yeah, thank you for listening. Actually, <laughs> I think it was me first. I think it was me first. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, thank you very much, Marte. And um, I just want to quickly also um, connect to what you said, uh, reminding the audience um, that they can send us their questions if they want uh, in the chat, uh, both on Facebook or on the website. So feel free to ask anything. And um, I wanted to uh, just also introduce Ari as I did um, introduce Marte. Um, he is an artist based in Mexico City, and uh, with this, I also like just want to point out that um, we are actually all based in different countries and different cities. And I think one of the few positive sides about the pandemic and the 
like restrictions and and weird circumstances that we're experiencing is that we actually can collaborate in this way which otherwise would have been much more complicated and or even impossible Anyways, Ari, Ari is based uh, in Mexico City and he's been collaborating with Mate on live cinema performances already in the past, as uh, was mentioned beforehand already. And his research is located in the, um, yeah, or focusing on the relationship between media and environment with the aim to understand the phenomena that are generated within nature and society through technology. One of his main fields of interest center around the notion of speed as a phenomenon of our time and slowness as a virtue. And um, I'm sure we will talk about that more in depth um, later on. But now I'm looking much forward to hearing more about the work and research from Ari directly. So Ari, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because I cannot hear myself. So, so um, um, I uh, I would like to talk about my my research as an artist uh, and what is my actual interest and what else do I do? You know? um, I started to. I, I'm going to start with this piece to explain this piece because I think here is from all of my research, actual research came from. So if you can, right, or is it there? All right, yeah. How are we going to to see the body in the future. No, it's it's a it's a speculative project. So how do we imagine the body in the future? So this project is supposed to be in uh, five thousand uh, DC. Uh, I, I mean AC. Sorry, my English is not dialectic English. So okay. This project, it's the idea of this project is to make like a time capsule and capture the gestures of the human body as we know it now, because uh, with all this like intervention, inter technological intervention, to change a lot. It's it's changing now. No, we now can see. Uh, Um, where are the bodies, the, the, limits of, the limits of the bodies, the boundaries of the bodies. No? Now we are extending our capabilities with technology. So in this sense, in the future, I imagine that our body as we know it is going to change. It's going to maybe disappear. You know? There's like a theories, uh, like in this um, movement of 2049 or 45, that they uh, they say that we're gonna migrate our conscience to a, digi a digital environment. No, so um, and th this is all around. No, this is this theories and not so uh, in, in the future is uh, research. They, they speculate about this. No, the uh, we're going to connect. But the idea of this project is it's, it's making a time capsule, capturing the gesture. And why the gesture? Because I think the gesture of the, the body, like the movements and how we interact with the world, it's what makes us human. No? And, uh, well, what defined us as human. No? So uh, this body, as we know it, the idea is to capture it with a with a Kinect. I'm going to change slides. This is the this is a piece. No, so you can see 
uh, inside you see like a hologram and it's fa fa uh, phantom gesture is the name because it's also remembers resembles or i don't know the word this uh, medical uh, terminology that it's a phantom limb so it, it has loosened a part of his body they still feel it be in a museum in the future as I told you, I don't know, like two or three or 5,000 years ahead. So future generations of biosynthetics and now nanobotics humans, if we can call them humans, they will know how to, how we, we were made, how we, the, our body was, no? So uh, I started from this piece, from this project, I started to research a lot in the future and to speculate about the future and the body <clears throat> gestures. I see also gestures as a cultural expression you know, without our, our body and our physical biology configuration. We were uh, big buildings and towers and cities. You know? so, so in the and how are we going to be able to fly maybe no uh, to fly with our own body now with we now can fly no so um, I started to realize I had to go back and I had to take flight I had to to start to study the the past no um and then i started to research a lot of a lot of things in evolution that is what i'm doing now i'm doing a research that it's called um adaptation to flight to say that uh, all this process that we are living and we live not just uh onto genetically how are, how did we get here and maybe that and the problem is that i'm i love so much the past and it's so wide so that's that, that i'm stuck now in the past um but it doesn't matter. Um, it, it will it will come to the future. So um, in in my project and in my research, it's always been these two lines of, of dialogue: the the future and technology, and the nature and uh, and how nature is affected by technology. So um, this is another piece about um, the body, but. But now this body that it has transcended to to the digital realm. Uh, and this is a bit of conscience of of that we still have body and we should we should So this is uh, how it's how it's drawn and it's uh, undrawn in this like interstice of space between the real and the digital, where it unfolds, and then you can see these uh, lines drawing the body and undrawing the body. You know? It's kind of a metaphoric way of saying it. This is a VR piece. Well, it's just a fragment. Um, but I've, I've always been 
uh, with nature and technology, as I told you, and I will show you this other piece. Well, this is uh, this is recorded in the in the space, the last piece you saw, uh, and it was a, a projection mapping in one of the, our uh, reserves in Mexico. It's called Nevado de Toluca. And like developing the technical. Um, sense but this piece is um is is, is seed the name is it is about how uh, life comes through space now it's 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 based on this idea of panspermic so uh, yeah how how from a meteor or from other uh, places from from space uh, contains life and then when it falls into an environment that can uh, uh, thrive then you can you can see uh, life now so this is this piece is about uh, it's about growth and in this space no in this uh, natural space so as I told you I I've been on this technology and nature I hope it's not it's not too long uh, for my time. Don't worry. My English is not so good to speak. I'm very sorry, but I'm trying to point the, the, uh, the use of technology uh, for the benefit of our environment, no? Because if we change it, if we uh, violent our environment, the only ones in trouble, or the more in trouble, are, are going to be us. No, the the ones that are going to be extinguished are, are, are going to be us. No, life, life uh, on on Earth, it's been long time before us, and this this is why I I talk about time and speed. And slowness, no. So uh, all things that we are going, trying to discover the last new paradigm in science, the new uh, notice, notice of what is happening. With this, no? Our um, point of view changes. So now we are not looking to our horizon, no? as Paul Virillo says. No, now the horizon has changed, and we are looking up. We're looking to the universe, and with all the technology, uh, it's not a vertical perspective, as, as Paul Virillo says. I think now it's like a like a um, inverted perspective. Now we're not we now we are not just looking up. We are looking inside with all these digital realms and these digital worlds uh, that we are looking in different virtual spaces. It's, uh, it's becoming uh, an inverse perspective. We are now trying to explore all these digital uh, worlds and uh, trying to simulate these other realities. No? Um, so in one of my explorations, I talk about the and the slowness and why slowness is a virtue and why we should um, 
we should like think about again of, of what we have in the environment of the technologies we do have uh, that doesn't involve uh, violent in nature no? that doesn't involve pollution and doesn't involve a lot of other things that can uh, harm our our environment and our world that is part of you know? um, and this is also that I, what I, I I think of Marte like Marte said you no know? that why we build this other piece this version of uh, of the person because we think our body is it's, uh, it's related totally to our nature. It's, it's a boundless nature. We're dissolving the. It's I, I see it like a like a, um, negotiating of different uh, organisms uh, to to have a to live better to thrive. You know? We are made of different organisms. We are made of a lot of uh, microbiomes, and our skin is full of different. So every time we wash ourselves, we take a bath, we, we get rid of these microorganisms that are part of us also, no? So I don't say that you shouldn't get a bath, but um, what, I, what I want to say is that we are all connected. No? So um, all these technologies that we have, uh, we should make them for the benefit of our planet. Also, on this slowness, of this, uh, I have this other project or research project that is called a price to price to the slow, where I use uh, technology, uh, like technology, like mechanical technology that doesn't really harm, or it doesn't harm in a really powerful manner uh, our Earth. So I use the the wind and the the. Um, the sun and the water as the sources of energy. Uh, I build pieces. So I have this piece that you can see on screen now, if, uh, if it's possible to see it again, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, it's powered by water. And, and as, as water, as a pluvial water comes down, it starts to cycle and start to um, to give water again and again, so it's kind of a it's not perpetual because thermody thermodynamics and entropy doesn't uh, uh, allow to make uh, this perpetual movement, but it, uh, it's a metaphor of, of how if you use these clean energies or yeah of, of nature, you can still live longer in a in a better in a better way, in a better world, no? Um, well, I think, I think I just end here. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry for my English, and thank you for, for, for listening to this chocolate conversation. Um, I had some uh, difficulties sometimes in hearing you, but um, I hope it was just my connection. Um, but it was really interesting to get insights in both of your work, um, both the artistic part and uh, on Marta's side, more also scientific part. And yeah, um, so uh, maybe we can just have a conversation uh, together now, the three of us, um, for a couple of questions. I definitely have some. And um, oh, now Marta turned on the light. <laughs> we can see you again. Uh, Yay. You <laughs> and the bird, bird t-shirt. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I should have one I'm as well. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just happy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Just I'm I'm Berlin black. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So whoever has questions can uh, again post them um, in one of our chats, and uh, maybe un until then I can already start. Um, I already had some questions before. Now some more um, thanks to the performance, 
and the presentations. Um, and maybe we can just start uh, because I was um, curious, um, I would be curious to hear about this experience um, again that you already kind of like mentioned both um, beforehand uh, that it was kind of a weird circumstance, of course, now with Corona and working remotely. Um, yeah, so how was it for you developing this performance for an online only context? So like what were the biggest challenges, um, both technically and in terms of the aesthetic results that you wanted to achieve? Well, I think my audio is not very good. Or is it now? I can hear you now, yes. Ah, great, because I, I think my... Okay, well, it was difficult. Distance is, is, a, is, a, is an issue to, to, to make these kind of projects. Uh, well, it's not an issue. It makes it a little bit di difficult because you uh, cannot have so much conversations or, or you cannot see the, the, the advance and the work of the other. And so it's a, it's a different process. You have to, the times change. So yeah, you have to, you have to wait uh, until some, you got something and then start this collaboration to, to give some updates and, and go on the conversation that it's not just about the concept. It's also about the aesthetics. You know? uh, the aesthetics in a in a um, in a I'm sorry in a sound and a visual manner, no? So yeah, I think it's, it's that's one of the of the main thing. I don't know if Matteo would like to say something about this. I mean, I think I first say that it's a it's a pleasure to work. Ari is my brother. And uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to work with uh, in such intimate bonds, no? Because uh, of course it's complicated and complex, but I think to to develop uh, creatively uh, in a, in such an uh, important bond is is quite an interesting process. So this has been really great, and I think we are getting better in this with years with with time, and. Uh, I think for me it's uh, just presence again. <laughs> it's it's about being there with people, having the chance to explore, to to yeah, uh, to exchange, to have a uh, rehearsal together. And more than that, I think for me the performance and even the talk, as I'm talking now, again it's it feels somehow monological. No, I I it time passes very differently when you're with an audience. I, so far it has. It felt a little bit rushed somehow, and and yeah, this feedback is, I guess, what I miss the most. And of course, the technical challenges. But yeah, yeah, I can say that from my side, I I miss a lot that after these live events, you're kind of alone at home, and it's really weird after, you know, you you had this kind of common experience, and you cannot continue the exchange and and just like be with the people um yeah that you shared it with so both uh, on a professional but also on a private or personal level so um yeah so i can imagine that it's really weird uh, working in that way um i guess it helps having uh these bonds that you have maybe sometimes it makes it more difficult um as it is with family i don't know <laughs> Um, yeah, but um, maybe just like now first questions come in from the audience, but maybe just because it kind of attaches to the first question uh, from my side, I I would add one more question, which is, um, or yeah, you've co been collaborating on a specifically live cinema events before, but as performances in a physical space. So now we've been talking about our own um, experience as kind of the, let's say, or you're as, as the artist and, and me as the producer. Um, um, but we, we all experience these times of lockdowns and severe restrictions, especially for cultural events, mostly as a 
loss and, and as a compromise. And my questions would be, where do you see the biggest differences in how your work can be experienced in the digital space as opposed to the physical space? So what would be the positive sides of working artistically under these um, special circumstances um, and with such a strong focus on the digital, um, if you see any? Well, I think the, the, the most obvious is that um, you can reach more people. You, know? you can connect to more people. Well, if you have the, the, right, uh, the right media to do that, no? But, uh, but yeah, um, but the thing is, yeah, the, that's, I, I think that's one of the positive things, that you can reach other people. Uh, the thing I, uh, for me is not to, to get to digital. I mean, um, I work with a beautiful group in, uh, in Mexico City, uh, in a Centro de Cultura Digital, where I lead the, the immersion lab also. And we are also, I'm also a cultural manager. So I, I, I'm also looking always, searching always to, for strategies to, to connect people and, uh, and, to, and to, to connect people in an effective way, because if not, it's like too, too, too limited, too digital, too, too cold. So um, I think that in every practice that we do, in, in our practice, in our personal practice, we aim to, to as we have like same interest, we aim to, to in, um, integrate other sensory uh, aspects no? in, in this kind of like cinema presentations. But it's not so easy. It's not so easy because uh, if you do not have a lot of research and a lot, a lot, of, a lot of time to experiment, um, it can be some like advices and, and things, but to integrate it as a, as a, as a project in a, in a work, in a, in a work of art, in a, presentation like this in a live performance. Uh, I think it has to have a lot of trial and error and to, to make this uh, happen. Now we have this other like um, project, it's called the Bureau of uh, Multisensory Investigations at, say, at, at the Immersion Lab. And uh, we are planning these um, tactical tactics so we can have uh, more practical aspects of this digital realm in house. So how can you touch one another even if you are not there? So exploring these, these, uh, these things about uh, tactile and temperature uh, and proximity and presence, I think it's, it's one of the main uh, things we need to integrate to our work of all of the artists that work with uh, digital media. So I think that's that's uh, the positive thing of this, but we have to to uh, aim that. No? Uh, yeah. Marta, you also that. want to add something or not really? Yeah, um, hmm? No, no, it's fine. Okay. So then uh, let's come to the question. Maybe let's start with a short question that was in the chat um, from someone who said, so cool. Um, do the artists have any plan for future projects together? Yes, we do uh, have a couple of pieces there, <laughs> but it's difficult at the distance. Right, it's mm. been really difficult. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, actually, uh, yeah, we do. And in a way, it responds also resonates with your previous question, Daniel. And I think if it wasn't for these digital or these constraints uh, resulting from the coronavirus situation, we wouldn't have had this collaboration and we wouldn't have had this live cinema piece, no? So, yeah, uh, it was good. We, we've been really trying hard to collaborate again for a long time. and. And we had to have this to have this crisis in order to do it, but yeah, hopefully yeah. soon. And to, yeah, to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, no. this has been the the way to do it. 
Great. No, I'm happy. I'm happy that we actually could still continue with the project. Um, it also the lockdown hit us right when we wanted to kick off. And uh, but it's yeah, as I said, like I think there's a lot of um, negative feelings about uh, the pandemic and the restrictions, of course. Um, but there are definitely also still some uh, f um, positive aspects about it, and that are. Uh, mostly um, related to the possibility of working very internationally and globally and um, transcending time and space um, in this way. Um, so, like, let me read um, another question to you that came on uh, Facebook chat. It's a bit of a longer question, so I'll just read it to you. So it says, about the piece, I'm interested in the mix between voices, animals, and the ocular approaches that hide a, that hide a will behind, but not entirely clear. And I think that blurred subjectivity is something that is uncomfortable and at the same time can mark a constant question while we never reach it. My question is more related to the sensory side. If we are take, talking about melting with the environment, according to the text of the piece and your presentations, when it happens, how can we imagine this experience? I think that this live cinema opens the way, but beyond that, doing an exercise uh, in speculation, what would happen to our senses, and not only with the visual sounds as now, visual sound as now, uh, but with the dialogue with other species, how do you imagine it? So it's a long question, many questions in one. Let me. Was it clear, or should I repeat the, the My, questions? It was a good. Uh, it was clear. I, I just, I, I think, imagining these these uh, universes of cooperation is what we must do. I don't think I have a particular model in mind on how this world of uh, interspecies cooperation would be. And like, yeah, uh, but I, I think that's the right question to ask. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for it. And, and I, yeah, uh, I, I don't think I have a clear answer. Maybe I. I think it's, it has a, a lot of layers. No, it has a lot of layers. And it's a really nice, uh, a really good question that I, I've been asking a lot of a lot of time ago now. Um, I've been researching um, uh, perception from different species, how they perceive, and and the subjectivity. It's it's so complex because even between humans we have different different perceptions. So we share this common world of perception. Uh, I don't know if it's objective reality, it's the way should we call it, but uh, it's, it has to be, it has to be, yeah, it has to be this negotiation, no? it has to be this, uh, this try to understand what is the perspective of, of, the other, of the other species, what are the needs of the other species and how can we, uh, how can we call, coexist and correlate in a more harmonic uh, way because I mean we have a really really bad um, um, cultural uh, how do you say I'm sorry my English sometimes uh, leaves me with some words but we have this uh, really bad built society I mean it's based on, on things that we really don't don't need, and we really don't know, don't see. Um, if you compare us to a people that works in a, in the country, no, or in the field, uh, we we don't know how to read our environment. If they if someone throw us to the woods, we die like easy because we don't know how to read our environment. We don't know how to uh, see if the weather, if it's gonna rain. If the fruit is okay, and well, we do have this uh, heredity, phyl phylogenetic heredity um, aspects of knowing things, no? But you see a chameleon, and the, the moment they leave, they start walking, 
and they start reading the environment and they know what's happening. So it's it's really complex. It's very interesting this question that, that you do. Um, for start for starting, I think uh, there's a really nice project. It's called Super Super Power Animal Super Power. I I don't remember the name of the of the artist, but I love it because it's so simple. It's for kids, but it's so simple, and you can uh, they build these artifacts with low fi technology, uh, like a microscope in the hands, and you can feel how it's to be an ant. Or they build this <clears throat> like with a periscope of a kind of a mirror thing, and they tell you how is to be a giraffe. Well, I, I know this is very simple ex examples, but maybe that's the way to approach with technology. How technology can extend our perception to get to know our, our environment and the perception of other animals and other needs of other species, not just animals. To make this negotiation <clears throat> a wider and not just in our body, because I mean, we have a, a lot of, we are not, we are a non human human, because we have all these different uh, non human that made us. Uh, and it's, and I, I love, I, I love to see this as a negotiation, you know? so one species has a negotiation with another and another and another and starts to build a really big organism and then we are part of this hyper organism. So to realize that starts to, to change our habits. Our habits in, in everything. I'm part of these very wrong habits we have. You know? We are not... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, com it's very complicated to... to to change as it is now, but to aim to use technology in favor of our environment, to get to know more our environment, it's also to get to know more the subjectivity of other species that made this uh, environment <clears throat> suitable. No? So I hope this answer a bit. I mean, this research, I think, I, I mean, and there's no answer. We are all uh, searching for this answer in uh, in our artistic practice, but also there's a lot of research uh, going on to make from perception, from psychology, from ethology. So there's a lot of different kind of science trying to study and realize how to understand and communicate with other. I can stop there because if no, I just go and go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's it's very true what you said. Like, I mean, it's one thing is to to build and train and um, empathy, which is, I guess, at the core of the projects that you mentioned with these animals and using technology. It's at the core, I guess, of what uh, Be Another Lab um, has been uh, working with or, or exploring uh, a lot. And then on the other hand, there's, I mean, yeah, really building empathy and, and training empathy and then also getting to know more about us being not just one entity, but instead um, a hybrid existence uh, and of different species, be it viruses or uh, bacteria or other entities. And in fact, like th that's a good transition to um, also just a short question, but there was someone in the chat asking about the, the poop implant, which is, um, mm -hmm. I guess, one of the examples of us being um, hybrid species um, and wanted to know more about um, yeah that so I don't know Marte if you um, can so tell a bit is if, more if, if the question is if I have tried it I have not <laughs> but, <laughs> um, no I mean I actually don't know too much uh, I've seen a few documentaries about it and it's quite uh, I mean it's fascinating it's fascinating that people can actually earn a lot of money because they have the perfect uh, bio in their poop no and and they like it's people can pay a lot of money and because it's not legal uh, but it has so many benefits people are doing it uh, um, 
uh, yeah, like on their own. So they are really asking their neighbors for their poop and, and injecting them, injecting it themselves at home. Uh, and of course, it's, I mean, ethically, or at least it, it may be gross for some people, but I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting. No, I think it's also interesting to reconcile ourselves with our with all the stuff that we generally throw away and we have no idea of where it goes and it may be poop or it may be anything else of all the stuff we all the poop we put in the world so yeah i don't know too much but it's marvelous and it's worth taking a look into it how how can people um look for it i think the question was how to find out more more about this topic Transplant is the, the technical name, fecal, F-E-C-A-L, transplant. And you will, yeah, you'll probably find a lot. I think there was a Vice documentary a few years ago and it was quite interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting <laughs> topic, but in general to find out like who is living inside us. I've read articles about what you also mentioned. Um, how um, viruses or other uh, entities actually change really our our moods and our um, not personality maybe that's said too much but kind of really interfere with us as a person um, on a long term and um, yeah so I guess it's it's really about in in the, all this interspecies communication it's it's about finding out actually who or what what are the species are there and then how to um, create and, and train that empathy and, and respect for, for them uh, in a way. Um, yeah, like uh, this is now changing a bit direction, but another question that came to my mind um, during your uh, presentation, Martha, was that the um, examples that you um, showed us in, in these different um, research projects were apart from the last one actually and uh, uh, we're all uh, based on our visual experience so like it kind of always came back or had such a strong focus on our eyes being um the kind of uh, door to how we perceive ourselves what's the role of of other senses um in this in this topic yeah that's that's a Interesting question. It's exactly what I look at. Uh, I look at the contribution of other senses and also trying to break this um, tyranny of the visual in, in science and in media in general. And also in terms of how we think about the body. So, I mean, first of all, I think for me, the best example is to think of the voice as another limb. And um, that when, as we are talking, we are in a way dancing with our limbs and these limbs are just interconnecting and resonating with each other in rhythmicity. And I think there's, there are all the reasons to think about the body and the voice in this way uh, technically. So uh, I just think it's generally a cultural bias that we have towards vision. But uh, so this is what I studied, the contribution of different sensory modalities and, and the second to last actually, which I had the wrong citation there. It's a, a paper that was published recently. It's with smell and it turns out that even scent has a contribution on how we perceive our body, which is quite obvious even when we're smelling or when we smell another person or recognize someone from the scent. So I mean, it's it's enormously it has an enormous weight, but of course we are very visually primed, and whether it's just a biological fact or uh, or something that is cultural, I think we don't fully know. But uh, definitely, there is a, a biological part of it. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like it's it's really extreme at the moment um, with spending so much time in front of screens and um, just having this kind of visual input. I feel like I sometimes really forget my body when I sit in front of the screen the whole whole day, and I just realize when getting up in the evening how completely. Um, yeah, like how my other senses didn't have any any 
any work to do during the whole day, but just my eyes that are very tired and uh, are the only, um, yeah, it's the only organs that um, get input. But yeah, and yeah, um, would crazy. you say that? Would you say that um, kind of bodily knowledge and bodily knowledge production is part of our Western society's collective practice? Like, in order to kind of bring it back to the the theme and the context of our um, project here, like, how do um, bodily knowledge and embodied knowledge still um, connect to um, collectivity and collective practice in your in your understanding for me i i mean uh, definitely i think we cannot disentangle knowledge from the body but i also think that it's uh, an implicit link uh, culturally it's not so explicit i think to think of the body uh, as knowledge and and the body dynamics and bodily relations as knowledge generally for people requires a little bit of effort in this culture and i think this speaks about the priorities of western culture but i think we cannot disentangle it and actually part of my my artistic practice is is about this and and there is within western institutions such as academia or at least science you really, I mean, it, you, it's a struggle to think of this bodily knowledge. So I have to do it outside of the institution. This is part of my artistic plastic practice because there is no, there aren't that many spaces where this can be considered rigorous, serious work somehow. No? So I think that also talk, speaks about the priorities of Western culture. But of course, as Ari says, no gestures are part of our bodily knowledge. Yeah. We can, we can uh, talk about Ayurveda, maybe, no? Or other different knowledge that totally are totally based on the body and the, the, the wealth of the body. Not, I don't know, it's, a, it's a knowledge, knowledge, uh, there's different and wide aspects of how can we acquire knowledge so there's like a chinese traditions like really all chinese traditions that are, are out of academia no? but it's a science and it's a really antique and old science as the as the indian traditions no hindus they have a yoga yoga is a, a bodily knowledge it's a like a powerful so powerful bodily knowledge knowledge that it and it's proved maybe it's not proved by certain by certain uh, western uh, thoughts and, and probatory uh, aspects i don't know how to say this in english sorry but but there's a lot of bodily bodily knowledge in a lot of different cultures that are not western culture so i think we also know that because I mean, yoga, it's widespread all around the world now. And uh, we know it's good to make some, some exercise and to get to know our body and to get to uh, feel it and to understand it. And to... So these practices that are not maybe on paper and, not, and are not in a, in a paper online in a scientific um, uh, magazine, but it's it's a, it is experiential knowledge also no? so i think it's very it's it's the same as important and the, as the as the research in academics no? in the academic, very much sorry. yeah um yeah like in, in the the experiential part i i'm blanking on the name now of the the um researcher or the theorist that coined it but um it's uh, he coined the term of orientation knowledge that we need bodily knowledge in order to reorient ourselves also and i think that's that gives a quite a good image that with that like just on a on a logic and just on a theoretical level um it it's not enough to under like to really be able to um use it effectively in our surroundings and in, in, in the environment. 
Yeah, no, I think that is part of the the revival process is to reconsider more seriously bodily knowledge as knowledge and as legitimate and important, at least as important as other ways of knowing. And I think that legitimate legitimation will yeah will be an important cultural step in western society if there are any steps to to make that are good yeah yeah we have a lot of uh steps that we can and should take probably um <laughs> as time is passing by and so far there were no further questions in the chat maybe we can end with some last one last, last question from my side um yeah, looking into the future, speculating a bit. <laughs> um, how do like in all this um, being uh, remote now, like um, turning to the digital, seeing positive sides, and um, in being able to collaborate more or differently, but also being restricted more. Do you see some kind of like impact on your immediate artistic? Uh, work already like um, in this this of this pandemic situation I either through like collaborating in different ways or wanting to explore um, other things um, or even topics that you think are now more urgent to um, be explored or researched in general Should I start? Oh. Uh, you can go ahead. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's definitely uh, affecting my my practice immediately. Like already with this, no, it's it's uh, we have to change and shift plans and ideas. And uh, I I don't think I have too much to add really. But uh, um, I just say that it's also really weird to be in a place like Switzerland where things seem to be somehow working as if nothing had happened. Uh, and the, I mean, that is, I think, Switzerland in general. But uh, yeah, yeah, of course, internationally, a lot of events have been canceled and, and we have to be creative on how we're going to get out of this situation and what, how to change our behavior for the best. But yeah, I don't think I have too much more to add. I do have, uh, I do think that we um, we have to get uh, uh, advantage of the situation in many ways. Uh, as a lot of people say, crises are opportunities also, no? But I don't think that we should uh think that we are gonna keep on this like this uh we shouldn't there's a lot of other political political and economical and a lot of other things involved in this situation so i think we should take advantage in uh take the good of this but try to uh, i don't know to try to still to go back to uh the more uh, uh proximity to, to get closer again you know, because this is uh, social dis distancing a lot of things it is connected so I think that's a good thing we are connected we are connected to a lot of other people that maybe I, I'm sure that all of us have talked to people that we haven't talked since a while because of this you no know, because of this situation so that's really good but um, but the touch and the hugs and all these relations in space and time and proximity, it's so important that we have to find ways to keep it going, to keep it going. So it's, it's a parallel road, no? I think we should, uh, we should think about uh, not losing that track because uh, now if everything goes online, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to change a lot, and 
societies are going to change. And I, I don't, I would like to speculate in a positive way, but I don't find where. So I think we have to go on parallel again. Don't lose the track. Both go on both tracks and, and and keep on finding the way to get together again. So um, that's what I think. Get together is definitely um, the right uh, goal. That's also what I really hope and. Um, yeah, hopefully we can get together um, at some point, uh, despite all the um, distances. And um, I also hope that the general situation, however it um, will develop, will um, yeah give you a lot of inspiration and and um, possibility to what I had written down that you one of you wrote in um, about the work that you are exploring notions and concepts like alienation nonverbal communication and the liquid body which I think um, is, is part of both of your work and um, I hope that the, the general circumstances will um, give you interesting moments and um, that we will collaborate again soon and see more of your work in another occasion and um, how that developed that, in the meantime that sounds, that sounds really good mm -hmm. <laughs> perfect so i think um, i would say yeah it's probably late now and um, at least uh, on our side of the world and um, let me thank you again very much for developing it, for doing all this work, despite all the difficulties and um, for the beautiful performance that will surely resonate with us for a little bit more. I would like to drink a wine with you now. Um, let's do it next time. And um, I yeah, can just uh, wish you a nice evening or day uh, for today. And hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you yeah, I hope to Thank see you. you. Have a good yes. Evening.